Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Deep Dive with DUI. Um, uh, it's a, for our, our October episode of, of Deep Dive. Um, it's gonna be a, a special one this time. Um, well, a special one for me. Um, anytime I get to speak with people who have been in diving for way longer than me and been doing a lot of cool things, uh, I get super excited about uh, just being able to speak with them, see what they're doing. So, um, but before we get started, I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that uh, this is streaming on Facebook Live at the same time. Um, so if you do have any um, questions um, that you'd like to ask our presenter, um, please type them in the message in either the Zoom comment or chat area or the Facebook Live comments. Um, and then we will answer those questions uh, throughout uh, the presentation um, whenever possible. Um, plus, uh, we'll have some time at the end. So uh, so this month, uh, our presenter is Bernie Chowdhury. Um, and some people may or may not know who he is, um, but he's very popular in, in the diving community. Uh, and he's done presentations for dive shows, shops, different clubs throughout the U.S. and, and different countries around the world. He is best known for uh, his critically acclaimed international top-selling book. Um, you don't often get to say that, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, his book, The Last Dive. Um, so this is a great book. So if you have not read a dive book lately and you want some some good reading that's hard to put down um, definitely read this book um, and then for some of those of you who don't have the time to sit down and, and read something that involves paper um, it is also as an audiobook so you can you can listen to that as you go back and forth from your uh, dive locations um, or work um, or if it's both that's even better um, so <laughs> your dive location is your work um, so going on, it, Bernie has this long, incredible, like, uh, resume. Um, he is, uh, is the founder and co-publisher of, of Immersed International Diving Magazine. Uh, he's been the editor of Historical Diver and also the Canadian-based Diver Magazine. So in case you guys don't get those, um, they're, they're pretty cool, um, have a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, his his work has appeared in various publications and he's been profiled in newspapers, magazine articles, um, obviously in the US and definitely around, around the world. He's been diving for over 38 years um, from recreational to technical. He's instructor, expedition leader, um, and he's been an industry consultant um, and he's made documentaries. Um, so we get to learn about a lot of that stuff. Uh, He's also uh, worked on uh, the hyperbaric medical technology, um, which is something that's really important, especially if you read some of this, uh, <laughs> some of this book. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that, you know, anything to do with uh, decompression, um, you know, that's super important. Uh, in 2001, he was Diver of the Year for, uh, by Education by Beneath the Sea. Um, beneath, the knees, beneath the Sea is a, a dive show that happens in New Jersey. Um, hasn't happened the past year because of things going on in our world, but hopefully that comes back. Um, so he's uh, going back to this instructor part. Um, he's an instructor for five different agencies. He's um, been teaching technical diving for 10 years, um, including advanced trimix, rec penetration courses, um, and he's able to bring students, you know, teach students down to 330 feet. So some of the, the new stuff that's going on, um, he's, he teaches in a scientific and research diving um, situation with Professor Nasreen. Uh, <laughs> I should have asked you how to say this before, um, but uh, that's his wife. Um, and they've been working on um, doing deep dive locations where they're actually looking for microbes to, for pharmaceutical use. Um, and it was kind of funny, he said diving for drugs. 
<laughs> but anyways, uh, he's also been uh, in 2019 named for the Gene Ritter Aquatic Award recipient um, for extraordinary service and education. So with that, I'd like to welcome Bernie and I'm going to highlight you here in our, our presentation. So you should be able to unmute yourself and, and so welcome. So this is great that you're able to present this month. Um, and before we get started, uh, because if, you, if people haven't figured this out myself, I am all about diving. I like talking about diving. Um, my daughter even jokes, you know, cause it's like, that's all my dad talks about is diving. So when I get a chance to meet different people that have been diving for a long time, one of the things I like asking them is what are you passionate about in diving or what, what keeps you diving and what's, you know, what just like makes you want to go out and, and dive even more. I mean, last, a uh, couple months ago, I was kind of thrown back when one of the answers was because I can see color. I never thought of that because um, this person was a Navy SEAL and all his missions were always in the dark. <laughs> and all of a sudden he was, you know, to continue on, he was diving in daytime where he got to see things. So Bernie, what's, what's your passion about diving? Well, um, I really like uh, shipwrecks. I've gotten, uh, after that I got into caves and now of course into scientific diving. And uh, the first thing though that got me into all the, the dive stuff was my uh, connection with my uh, German relatives. My mother's from Germany. I, I speak the language reasonably fluently and, and have been there a lot. And um, actually I've, I've got a, uh, a story, a long form uh, article that I recently published. We'll have a link to that later if people want to know more about the sort of the personal connection. And I do write about that also in my book, The Last Dive that you previously mentioned. That's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, because especially what you're going to be talking about today, that's like, it's another one of these, um, <laughs> I guess it's, I like talking about diving and like talking about places I have not been yet to yet and want to go to. So, um, so with that, um, the, the floor is yours now to present. Okay, so uh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, can you see that? The, uh, we're gonna be speaking today about the controversial war wrecks of Scapa Flow in the Orkney Islands, which is in Scotland. Okay. Now, where is the Orkney Islands? You can see here, this is Scotland and the Orkney Islands are right in here. Uh, Shetlands are here and of course, Norway is up this way, just to give you a reference of where we are in the world where we're gonna be speaking about. Right, so it's definitely cold water. Yeah, um, the water, now, now if you've been diving in California, the water is actually uh, generally a little bit warmer than California water. And for the uh, Northeast divers here in the United States, it's very, very comparable where the water uh, here inside Scapa Flow, which is actually a bay in the Orkney Islands um, and was the deep water anchorage of the British fleet in both World War I and World War II, uh, the temperatures are about 55 on the surface, and that's at Fahrenheit, of course. But if we dive some of the block ships that block off the, the islands here uh, and here and, and in the spaces here, um, because of the tidal flows from outside, that's more like diving California waters. And you see kelp and all of that. I have a little bit of video uh, later that I'll show of one of those block ships, because the visibility on the block ships is definitely better than on the the fleet wrecks that we're gonna be talking about. And they are all centered around this island, Kava. So the, the wrecks were anchored here. And here we see an aerial view um, provided by Charles Tate Photography. I thank him for that. And this here is the town of Stromness, which is where I've stayed mostly. I've been to uh, Orkney at least 14 times. Um, one time I went just for a wedding, which was kind of cool. Uh, but most of the time it was for the diving. and Stromness is closest to the German World War I high seas fleet, which is the thing that really attracts divers from around the world to come diving here. Uh, and, and here, now the, this was the old ferry pier, the ferry doesn't go here anymore, but this is actually, I'll show you a closer shot uh, coming right up, but this here is where the boats are in the harbor. And this is the ferry inn where I've stayed quite a lot and, and it's within 
easy distance of the boat. And one of the nice things is the boat leaves at 9 a.m. in the morning. So you have a hearty Scottish breakfast, you come out here and you get on the boat and off you go. It's only about a 10, 15 minute run to the first wreck. So here is a shot by um, John Ganson of the Boston Sea Rovers. And this is the bridge of one of the light cruisers that went down here. And as you can see, it's a black and white shot, of course, but you could see here, visibility can range anywhere from 15 feet to 50 feet. Um, some people have said it, it, it can range as high as 80 feet, but uh, you know, the best viz I think I've ever had is about 50 feet on the German fleet wrecks themselves. And here we have a picture of what the German fleet looked like while it was anchored at Scapa Flow. Now, many people think that the First World War ended in November of 1918, but that's not true. It was an armistice, meaning that uh, Germany was exhausted from the war, its people didn't want to continue it, and its leadership knew that you know, it was pretty disastrous at that time. So Germany basically asked to sit down to negotiate a peace treaty with Great Britain and allies, uh, which at that time also included the United States. The United States had entered the war late, but nonetheless, they were an ally uh, along with France. Um, the Russians had been fighting uh, with the United States, France, and Great Britain, but had at this time, they had surrendered to the Germans in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. But anyway, um, so in 1919, the uh, Treaty of Versailles was going on in France. And as part of the negotiations, the British insisted that the German high seas fleet be interned, they be disarmed, and they had the least number of sailors or what they call the skeleton crew on the ships to be able to run them. And this is what they, they looked like. They were always considered enemy combatants because the treaty hadn't been signed yet. So as we go through this, and no matter how much we prepare for a journey, we can always be surprised when we get there. And certainly over my, my 14 trips or so to Orkney, I've, I found a lot of different stuff out. And uh, this reminds me of when I was down in Australia and what I found out about uh, neighboring New Zealand, <laughs> this courtesy of Dr. Simon Mitchell here. Um, so we can find out about some unusual things that go on. And one of those is that if you go with people to the Orkney Islands, you might say, oh, it's, a, it's a, just a diving trip. But if you have a significant other or even friends that want to go someplace that's interesting but aren't divers, they may be interested in many of the archaeological monuments um, that are in the Orkney Islands. This shows Scarabray, which was a Neolithic village, uh, 6,000 years old. It was discovered in 1850. Uh, on a farmer's land, he, he went down to see how much um, uh, of his land was washed away by water after a, a winter storm. And it's now a protected site. And here we could see uh, Scarabray had been inhabited by about 50 or 60 people for quite a long time. And you could see that they had these huts here. Um, they were covered with, uh, you know, earth and stuff to keep them warm from the wind. And you can get a, a, you can walk right here. You can't walk within these huts, although I'm, I'm standing outside here where they do let you go. I, I'm not a, a real big guy, I'm about five, seven. So you can imagine the people who lived here must have been hobbits, as you could see, I'm, I'm right here. Uh, there's a it's in really entrance. good condition. Yeah, it, it's amazing, um, in fact, for a 6,000 year old village, right? But of course, we're here to, to go diving. So uh, part of the, the diving, the, the boats, uh, as I had shown you before, this is actually the harbor here in, in Stromness. And you could see the boats actually tie themselves up to one another. And uh, as many of you might know that there are a lot of rivalries in a wreck diving community. Um, I write about it a lot in the last dive for the US Northeast. And you can't imagine them doing that here where I am in, in New York. Um, one of the things though, this is both good and bad. And, and unfortunately, there has been um, there have been a, a, some deaths where, you know, a captain got a little bit too drunk, came out and, and uh, you know, at night to sleep it off on his boat and, and fell into the water. That has happened on, on more than one occasion. Uh, this is not very far from, from the bars as I had previously shown you. Okay. 
Now back uh, to, the, to the fleet again. Some of the fleet themselves uh, had fought, or most of them had fought at the major battle of the First World War, the Battle of Jutland, um, which the Germans actually called the Battle of Skegard because uh, it took place off the coast of Denmark. This is HMFS Markgraf, um, which was a dreadnought class battleship. The dreadnought itself was first uh, built by the British and it led to an arms race between Great Britain and Germany that led up to the First World War. But this uh, ship itself is 597 feet long and has a beam of 97 feet. I mean, this is an absolutely massive ship. I'll explain wow. in a moment why it looks like it's in such bad shape. And it is, it's in, in disrepair here as it's anchored in Orkney. Today, there are three dreadnought class battleships that remain in the Orkney Islands. I think they're one of the highlights to dive. And the Markgraf is the deepest of those in, in uh, over a little over 150 feet in the flow. And I'll explain in a moment what all these holes are because clearly the, these holes were created by some explosion. So let's talk first about the sinking. So as I previously mentioned, the Treaty of Versailles negotiations were going on in France to actually come to a formal conclusion to the end of World War I. But what was happening was the uh, German officers that were on the fleet themselves were getting three-day-old newspapers and this was because, well, there were delay uh, issues uh, getting the major London newspapers, and also the British Admiralty just decided mm, they'd give the Germans old news. But this actually worked against everybody, because you see, it was hoped that the ships themselves, and, and these were among the most powerful warships in the world. They had challenged Britain for supremacy of the high seas, as I had mentioned at the, the Battle of Jutland, or Skegarat, as the Germans call it. And so... The Germans, the French, and the Americans all hoped to get some of these ships for themselves as prizes of war, as part of the treaty negotiations. But when the German officers read about the treaty negotiations potentially breaking down, and if they broke down, that would have meant war would have continued, these ships were unable to protect themselves because they were disarmed. Remember, that was part of the, the British terms to sit down to negotiate the peace treaty and they would have easily been captured by the Royal Marines. So this man, Admiral von Reuter, was in charge of the fleet, and he had taken an oath, as the German officers, all officers in the Navy did, and I'm pretty sure uh, that existed also in, in all of the navies of the world, that they would do everything in their power to prevent their ships from falling into enemy hands. So von Reuter, met secretly with his officers, and they planned the scuttling of the ship. That means the sinking of them. The enlisted men were not informed of this because there had been a communist uprising in the German World War I Navy. Most of the officer class came from the aristocratic class, and the enlisted men were basically the working guys, the working class guys. So there was a real lot of resentment uh, between uh, the two classes and the officers had a great deal of difficulty in managing just the, the upkeep of their ships. And in fact, their enlisted men refused to even clean up the ships, which is why the Markgraf, which I'd shown you before, was in such disrepair and looked so, so bad. And here we can see some of the enlisted men, they're, they're fishing. Um, they were not actually allowed to go on shore because again, as I previously mentioned, they were considered enemy combatants. Until the peace treaty would be signed, they would be considered enemy combatants. So they were bored. They were there in the winter um, between uh, 1918 and into 1919. And uh, finally uh, up in June was when the sinking occurred. So there's a very, very harsh winters up in Orkney, it, it's dark most of the times very northern latitude and very, very windy and cold. So these guys were pretty miserable. And during the sinking itself, um, there was a school outing on the uh, tugboat, the Flying Kestrel. The children and all the people of the Orkney Islands could see their enemy boats and they decided, oh, let's go have a look at them up close. This is, the scuttling was a surprise to everyone 
and there was nothing like it in history before or since. 74 German warships were sunk by um, their own countrymen, and uh, yeah, almost all of them went to the bottom. As the flying Kestrel and the children on board were going around these ships, some of the younger children thought it was a show put on for their amusement. Of course, the uh, chaperones and teachers and the older kids knew what was going on. And it was a very dangerous situation because of the massive uh, weight of these ships going down. They could easily have sunk the flying Kestrel themselves if the, if the Kestrel had either gotten directly caught by the funnels and stuff or um, had they been sucked down by the suction of, of these ships going down. So the uh, British Royal Marines that had been guarding the fleet had been out on a naval exercise and they came back and literally ordered the Germans to stop the sinking of their vessels. Now keep in mind, this was always German property, the German ships were, because the treaty hadn't been signed. And also the way that von Reuter and his officers had set this up, once they initiated the sinking, they basically opened sea cocks that were in the bottom that are, are designed for this. Think of a bathtub uh, drain, right? The plug, you pull the plug and then you can't stop it because even though these sea cocks could be controlled from the bridge of the ships themselves, they had smashed all of those pipes so that once they opened the sea cocks, they could not be closed. And the watertight doors were arranged in such a fashion that they couldn't be closed either. So once it was initiated, there was no turning back. Unfortunately, the British were so frustrated by this that they, they shot and killed eight German sailors. Uh, it was not Brit the, the Royal Navy's finest moment. I can certainly say that. Now, some of the wrecks came um, to rest and, and became hazards to navigation. Here you see one of the uh, parts of a keel here, and this is a uh, British drifter called the Rama that would that just literally ran aground on the hull of this German ship. It basically the ship turned upside down or turtle as we call it. And so this became a big hazard for navigation. Here we see uh, a British um, raiding pulling down the German flag. The German flag had been raised, uh, and this was the, the naval flag, had been raised in defiance of the British when von Reuter ordered the sinking of the ship. Now, this is ironic uh, because later, many, many years later, of course, after this, I was reading uh, a book by uh, Gary Gentile, and, and this was actually a destroyer, and it became part of the what are known as the Billy Mitchell wrecks off of the coast of Virginia. And I coped. Gary and I said, can this be true? Is this part of the German World War I high seas fleet wrecks? And he said, yeah. What happened was this wreck was taken in tow or the ship was taken in tow, it was trying to be sunk and then it was grounded in shallow water. And so it didn't fully sink. So what happened was the, um, after the, the treaty negotiations, this ship was awarded to the United States. So the United States basically had it sent over to the United States, and then they sank it as part of Billy Mitchell's experiments that proved that warships could sink planes. This was something fairly new when it was uh, the Ostfriesland was the largest ship that was sunk in that. But what this means is this particular wreck was sunk, uh, was owned by two different countries and sunk by both countries willingly. So I, I don't know if that's happened before in history either. But anyway, the, the salvage, what happened? So all of these wrecks were, were littered on the floor and the British Admiralty didn't know what to do with it. So they, they said, okay, people can bid on this and then, then they could, you know, cut these wrecks up and sell the scrap. So this guy, Edward Cox, buys the, the Scuttle German fleet. And in a certain way, he was had an advantage over everybody else because he was neither a diver nor an engineer. All the experts said it wasn't possible, but of course, Cox was a businessman. He had made a lot of money during the First World War uh, as a businessman selling supplies to the British. He'd never raised anything off of the floor, but his solution was brilliant. He hired a guy who knew what to do, and that guy was Thomas McKenzie. 
who was a diver. Now you're saying here, okay, this guy uh, doesn't look like much of a, a diver here. Um, so I got a picture of him, there he is. Um, so of course, you know, hard hat diving was done then with umbilicals to the surface. And he came up with a brilliant idea to raise the, the wrecks. This is one of the dreadnoughts, which I, which again are these huge, huge wrecks. Now, what are these things you might ask? Well, these are boilers that were salvaged from the different wrecks themselves. And then they were welded end on end. And then ladders were put inside these. Uh, now, mind you, this was one, they were still on the bottom. And what would happen is first divers would go around on the outside and patch up any holes. And how could they tell where there were holes in the, the wrecks themselves? Well, they pumped compressed air into it from the surface. And then when the compressed air was pumping out most of the water, people, the civilians would go down here and they would patch the rest of the holes from inside. At this point, divers would also put chains and stuff underneath the wrecks. And then with a combination of compressed gas inside the sealed up hulls and the chains being pulled by tugboats and dry docks, they would then raise the wrecks to the surface. And this is what it looked like immediately after they had done that. Hmm. So here you could see a workman going down the ladder. And here's a picture of what that looked like. Now, mind you, these guys are diving under, they're breathing compressed gas, right? So they could have also suffered uh, the bends here just like divers can, because even though it was a gas environment, they were in an air environment, they're breathing compressed gas under pressure themselves. And here's what it looked like. Some of the, um, uh, here, the, the guys with the hand crank pump, uh, and one of these would be able to um, basically uh, keep two guys alive. So some historic shots here. And this is, um, you could see here the propellers on one of the dreadnoughts. And this here was a floating dock that is outfitted with a crane that Cox also purchased for, for this venture. Nothing like this has ever, had ever been done before. And the scale of this, I believe is unprecedented. Um, there was something close to it in, in the Red Sea, but uh, I believe this, uh, and that was during the Second World War, but I think that, um, that this is still a much larger salvage. And so here basically you can they, see, would, they would build those, those tubes beforehand, then lower it down and then weld it to the hull? Well, again, those were it. boilers. They actually right. salvaged the boilers from the, the various um, scuttled wrecks, and then they would make those uh, entry right. points. They welded them together. On the and surface and then, and then lower it down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here you could see one of the one of the guns is a small gun here from um, this must have been a, a destroyer or a light cruiser. And here you could see some of the guys that were were working on it. A lot, a lot, a lot of piping, a lot of rather cabling here. So, you know, it was a very dangerous job in a lot of ways. A lot of stuff could happen. And fortunately, though, um, it didn't, you know. Now this is a, a great concept, especially for uh, technical divers. Uh, bring up the whole ship, and then you can take the artifacts out, right? So this uh, is called, you know, taking out the artifacts. Some of these things actually can be seen in museums in Orkney. Uh, there are actually two museums. One is the Military Museum on the island of Poi, and one is the Stromness Museum in Stromness. So you can get to see some of this stuff. And I'll talk about uh, artifacts and whether later whether divers can take them or not. This is what the dreadnought battleships looked like as they were actually being taken to the breakers yards. You can see it's upside down here. The props, the, the shacks here for the guys to live in. Guys would even play cricket on the way. And this was quite some way to the Scottish mainland. Tugboats here, of course, pulling this thing down. And here's guys playing cricket for amusement. And sometimes, you know, the, there was obviously some wave action going on, although it's a pretty calm day here. Uh, and, and one of these, this is the uh, Fun der Tan passing underneath the bridge. Uh, one of these dreadnoughts came very, very close to crashing into a major bridge. It would have been a disaster for people and, and businesses, for commuters and all that stuff. But uh, luckily that was narrowly avoided. And then at the breakers yards themselves, they were propped up on bricks and then guys would start chopping away and cutting away at it for the scrap metal. 
Um, the other thing that was, was used at the time of the salvage itself, there had been a coal miner strike in the British Isles. And so what uh, Cox and company did was they, they had the men salvage not only the boilers from these wrecks, but the coal that was in there. And so they were able to keep all of their generators and pumps working. And they also sold uh, the coal to the people in the Orkney Islands to keep them warm. So the people in the Orkneys were actually very fortunate with all of this because they were warm in a, in a cold winter when the rest of people throughout the, the United Kingdom were uh, very cold because of a shortage of coal. Here is one of the light cruisers. This is the Brummer. This is now changed. And, and the illustrations that I'm showing are from Rod McDonald's book, Dive Scapa Flow, which is a, an excellent uh, guide and, and even has some history to it. And I recommend that if you are planning to go to Scapa. Now, all of this has changed. I, I don't, when I first stove it, this is what it looked like. Now, all of this part has literally just been swept away and, and just collapsed in a winter storm. What are these holes? I told you I'd tell you about them. Well, these were actually the holes that the salvagers blew into the wreck so that they could get to the valuable ferrous metals, the engines and the boilers. The boilers, of course, you know what they were used for, and the engines could be sold also for scrap um, because they were very uh, valuable as metal. Still to this day, metal is being taken off of these wrecks. Why? Because steel itself, to make it, takes a tremendous amount of, um, uh, of air. Since the development of the atomic bomb, we've of course exploded so many atomic bombs, uh, even in tests, that uh, you're not gonna be able to make metal and not have some kind of, um, you know, radioactive sort of elements in there. And that would throw off various medical instruments that need to be made with pure metal. And so when they need those very delicate medical instruments, they'll take some of the scrap from here and use that to make those instruments. Hmm. So here is a, uh, a scan and you could find this at, um, at this email address here. Uh, this is a scan done and, and you could find all of these online at this particular address. So now you could see what I'm talking about here with the Brummer, right? That would be this whole area, this here, and it's collapsed. So again, um, showing you the island of Kava, and here we are, most of the wrecks are right here. There are some smaller wrecks also. Uh, a lot of them aren't worth um, diving on. They're just, you know, a little bit of scrap and stuff. But here are the main wrecks. You could see four dreadnought class battleships. So they're the Markgraf, the Konprinz Wilhelm, and the Koenig. And the other ones are light cruisers. And the, the Bayern is uh, a dreadnought class battleship. But the only thing that remains of the Bayern are the turrets. So they're upside down and they're buried in the sand. Kind of an interesting story because um, the turrets are in 130 feet depth, but you can actually go inside. I don't recommend doing this. They, one diver, at least one has died inside the turrets because you have to literally crawl over the 16 inch um, uh, guns to, to get into the living quarters where the guys operating the guns actually lived. Um, uh, a friend of mine has been in there and, and has found a lot of uh, interesting stuff. The, there was a lot of um, signs and stuff like that on the, on the, uh, the walls. Uh, a friend of mine, Keith Bicken, actually it was his wedding that I, that I went to. Um, he runs a, uh, a business there where he uses an ROV or remotely operated vehicle. And he takes tourists out to the fleet wrecks um, and, and he will narrate, um, you know, what it's like. He, he shows them what the wreck is like. So obviously for non-divers, if they're curious, it's a great way. He's got, you know, uh, television sets uh, set up. In, on his boat, comfortable seating and all that. And uh, it's a really fantastic way for people to be able to, to see history that aren't divers. So again, if you're going with somebody in your group or your significant other that's not a diver that might want to see this, this would be a great way uh, to be able to do it. 
So diving today within SCAPA flow, all remaining wrecks have a high profile. There's no need to go deeper than 130 uh, feet, which is the US recreational depth. Um, deepest wreck is the Markgraf at 150, but it comes up to 70 feet of the surface. Decompression diving is allowed, and now all gases are available, including Trimix if you're certified to use it, 100% oxygen, nitrox. When I first started uh, diving there, um, it wasn't available, but then uh, I guess around the mid 90s, it became available. I spoke to the skipper that I was diving with, John Thornton, and he was actually pretty, you know, open minded. He was very open minded and looked into it. And he was the first one that was offering nitrox uh, in Orkney. And um, he, he now offers also Trimix. So here's another shot of the mark graph itself. And you could see here from the scans um, the, the bow of the wreck and how they'd blown up the stuff to be able to get to the ferrous metals. Uh, another shot of it here. The Kronfins Wilhelm, this is in meters. Of course, this is uh, about 100, uh, 100 feet or so. Um, so. I think the Koenig is in 120 feet, but this here is about 60 feet to the top. So it's a tremendous um, you know, profile that you have. If any of you have dived uh, the San Diego, which is um, a US World War I uh, warship, uh, it's off of the coast of New York's Long Island. It's very much like this, where it's turned turtle or upside down, and you have what's called a light side and a dark side. There is penetration that can be done on these wrecks, but it's not recommended unless you are trained in overhead environments and have a redundant gas supply. And I do recommend a guideline. And again, here is um, what these wrecks. Right, because uh, these are like these are real wrecks. They're not they're not yeah. something like, uh, for example, the Yukon in San Diego, where it's been cleaned. Yeah. You know, everything has an exit. So there's possibilities of pipes, uh, whatever, hanging and in, in, you know, as well, obstacles or restrictions. Of, yes, and the Yukon's a great dive, and uh, I remember Faith uh, Ortiz ta taking me on. Uh, the Yukon and even through the little swim through uh, section that they have. So there's one question. I don't know if you you're, you've answered it yet um, or going to talk about it. Is how many ships were were raised or salvaged versus how many were are still left? Well, um, there there are seven wrecks, uh, as I've said. Though those are the major wrecks mm -hmm. um, from the from the uh, World, German World War One High Seas Fleet. Three um, dreadnought class battleships and four light cruisers. There are remnants of some other wrecks, but they're, they're really not worth diving. However, this is a remnant, the turrets of the Bayern that I had spoken about before. There are two sets of turrets. So you can actually go down, you could see one of them and then swim over to the next set. This is a pretty long distance here. I wouldn't recommend trying to do this all. If you have a scooter, okay, yeah. Um, but you know, if you're going on one of these and, and they do make, I think for some interesting photography, I don't have any shots of this, unfortunately, but. Uh, um, you know, so what happened to the rest of it? Just okay. So what ha happened? <laughs> you can see. You see right here. This is a huge indentation. You probably see that, right? Yeah. The huge indentation where the the dreadnought class battleship came down. You know, turned turtle upside down. Uh, it was pulled down by by the turrets. Now the turrets themselves are so heavy. Most people don't know this. They're actually not physically attached to the wreck, uh, to, or to the to the ship itself, because when the ship is, as it's supposed to be, upright, um, those guns are so heavy, they will just stay where they're placed. Yes, they can turn, but the, you know they're not going to fall out. Well, if the ship turns upside down, you, know, you got bigger problems and worry about if your guns are going to fall out. But that's what happens. The turrets fall out. So anyway, the, the Bayern was down here, and it took several efforts to get the, the um, ship up onto the surface. The first time they did it, the, uh, they had pumped too much air into it. So they, they pulled and pulled, you know, as I showed you before with the chains and they used their, um, uh, their dry dock. And then they got the, the wreck up, but there was too much gas. It came up too fast. And then the, the, the air escaped and the wreck itself went back down. Now, why did they have to pump so much air into it. Well, these turrets were here and still attached to the wreck. And although they weren't physically attached, they were still catching 
enough of the other parts of, of the, the wreck that the main uh, uh, hull of the wreck couldn't be lifted. So it took um, at least, I think, two efforts. I think on the third effort, they finally got the, the Byron up and, and they could float it off to the breakers yards in Rosseth, I think it was. So here is one of the typical uh, ships that you'll see when you go diving there. And you could see here, this is actually, you know, where you'll be diving. This is a bay. You could see that there's islands all around. And the way that the, the diving is done is that they don't anchor into the wrecks themselves. They believe that that's dangerous because if a diver is in trouble, they have no way to get to the diver if they anchor into it. So, um, so as you're preparing uh, to dive, and by the way, this is on, on John Thornton's boat, and you can see in the background, he's got his uh, supply gases to be able to mix whatever gases that, that you want. He, the tanks get filled up right on the boat themselves. So once you've got your gear on the boat, you don't have to haul it off every day. The only thing you know, that I was taken off was my computers. And here, this is obviously an older shot. Um, I think this is from uh, a shot by Thomas Aesop. And so this here is my battery for my light. And I would just take that to the hotel room and then charge it up overnight. But otherwise, all the other stuff you leave on board, you get your tanks filled right there. So it makes for a very comfortable week of, of diving. Um, so what, what they do is they come up to the, the wreck itself and you stand here, your buddy, now this is Evie Dudas. Uh, she was the first woman to dive the Andrea Doria. She was my buddy on, on this trip. Um, and so what the skipper does is he pulls up near to the uh, shot line, which is not an anchor line, it's a shot line. So it has basically a, um, a buoy on it and it just goes down to the wreck. You're not supposed to pull yourself down the line, but just use it as a guide so you can go down to the wreck itself. Then you jump in into the water and there'll be a little bit of a current that helps you, but you have to, to swim so that you don't miss it or, or get pulled uh, off of the, the, the shot line by the current. And then your buddy does the same thing. So coming back, it's the same. You come up and uh, then, you know, you just signal I'm okay. And then the boat will come over to get you. So here at the bottom um, of one of the uh, shot lines, you could see here, it's, although it's directly on the wreck, this one, um, you may be able to pull yourself down on this one because I think they've tied it in here. But another shot by John Ganson, you can see divers dropping their stage bottles to be able to come back to this line. But that's not necessary because especially with the larger ships, the dreadnoughts, it would take you a, a lifetime to explore it all anyway, but certainly it would limit how far you can go and explore the wreck if you were just planning to come back, which is the practice that we usually do here in the United States, for example, on, on a wreck. But here, what you could do is you could swim with your stage bottles. You could then be uh, halfway you know, down the wreck. And then when it's time to ascend, you shoot a lift bag and you just come up slowly underneath that lift bag, which also helps um, the skippers who just basically uh, have their boat a little distance off, but they're looking in the water for your lift bag. And then you signal that you're okay and you wait for them to come over and get you. So it's a very, very comfortable way of diving. I, I enjoyed that very much. And again, you've seen the, the shot here of the bridge and another shot by uh, John Gantz. And this is the bow of the, uh, the um, stern of the Brummer, which no longer exists uh, as, it, uh, uh, as it did in this particular shot. Again, I've shown you the, the results of that. Now here is, is one of the wrecks. This is a photo by Scott Rowan. We were just doing a little photo shoot here. Um, this is just part of the remnants of one of the German destroyers. But again, uh, other than a, a place to be able to do a photo shoot, um, as far as a, a real wreck dive goes, I think there are a lot more exciting wrecks at Scapa to dive than this one. This is just, you know, basically some hold plates that are, that are laying there. Most of the wreck itself has been salvaged. Um, but it is very uh, picturesque here in the sense, here's some, you know, there's kelp-like stuff. And it's more like diving California. The viz is pretty good. And again, you have some kelp there. And so is this all an, from a, a single dive trip or is this from, are these all from oh, they're, different they're, trips? Yeah, different all trips. All mixed back yeah. and forth. Yeah, they're, these are from different trips. So um, this is a little blurry shot, but I wanted to show it because I think it's representative of, of this particular 
wreck, like I said, the hull plates and stuff. Again, a, a shot by Scott Rowan. I was going to say that light looks kind of a little bit older school, old school. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, this is this is from some time ago. Yeah. Um, so here's what I was talking about when you're shooting the bag. And uh, yeah, they, they talk about an old school light. Look at that one. Um, and my stage bottle and all this. And there's another diver behind me um, also shooting the bag. You know, we shot separate bags and just, you know, do your deco on it and go up. Yeah. Do you recognize what these are? I don't know if you do. These are Aladdin Pro Dive computers, and they're pretty old. So it, they're definitely dated by the gear here. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's that's before my time. Yeah. Okay. So um, training. It's a it's an ideal cold water location. Uh, the water temperatures are similar to the Northeast U.S. and Canada, and also in California, I would say. Um, you could do the classroom here and dives there. Um, deep wreck and tech there all the gases are available. And it's a great place also, um, if you're doing a rec penetration class, there are some, some very, very wide open areas that are nice to penetrate. Um, there are passageways that you can go in, but again, you should be doing this with the backup equipment and, and with proper training to be able to do this safely. So there are some war graves here, no diving on these. The most famous war grave is the Royal Oak which was sunk by Gunther Plein in his U-boat U-47. There were um, ships that were purposefully sank. They're called block ships. They were sank between the islands so that this wouldn't happen. Um, in the First World War, they were effective. But in the second, by the time the Second World War had rolled around, the currents are so strong going between the islands that the block ships themselves were moved so that Gunther Plein and his U-boat could manipulate their submarine past these wrecks that were intended to block them from getting to the British uh, High Seas Fleet Anchorage or the British um, Northern Fleet Anchorage, excuse me. And they were able to sink the flagship here at the Royal Oak uh, at anchor. It is very much like the, um, the American ship Arizona that was sunk at Pearl Harbor. The ships are, are roughly the same size and, and almost the same number of men died uh, they, the ship sank, both of them, in, in about 20 minutes, and about 800 uh, sailors died on them. It, it is now marked by a, a bell buoy, and um, definitely diving on this particular wreck is not allowed at all. Uh, and, and these wrecks are protected by, by British Acts of Parliament. Uh, another war grave is the HMS Hampshire. Now, this is outside the Orkney Islands itself. And here you could see a fairly large wreck. And its importance, and this is, it sank during the First World War. And the importance is that it was taking British Secretary for War, Lord Kitchener, and he was actually the model for this poster, right? We have one uh, like this with Uncle Sam, right? The, for the United States recruiting poster. But this was the original poster that was for the British. And they used Lord Kitchener, who was a hero to the British and then the British Empire, for his, um, uh, his work in, in liberating the Sudan from the so-called Mad Mahdi. That's a whole nother story. But anyway, in 1960, 16, um, Lord Kitchener and almost his entire general staff were heading from the Orkney Islands all the way up here. They were going to go to Archangel uh, Russia to be able to have a meeting with the Russians themselves while they were still uh, supposedly fighting the war against the Germans, because what was happening was a lot of money and materiel were being sent to the Russians, and they weren't doing a very good job fighting the Germans, and ultimately they did surrender to the, the Germans, as I had previously mentioned. So Lord Kitchener and his staff were originally uh, intended to go on a safe route going this way. Now that route here was regularly swept for mines that the Germans, of course, would lay all around here because it was a major anchorage for the British fleet. But instead, there was a major storm. Uh, I think it was a, a gale force uh, six or seven that had kicked up. And so they, the Admiralty, who was sitting comfortably in uh, London, said, oh, no, Kitchener, you could still go. And, you know, we, instead of going around the eastern side of the Orkney Islands, go around the western side, even though it's not swept for mines. 
th this will, you know, the whole thinking there was it would protect the the islands would would protect the ship uh, from from so much wind and it would be more tolerable. But in the event um, the the Hampshire then went out and boom, hit a mine right here and sank in a little over 200 feet of water. So I was, uh, according to, to um, Skipper John Thornton, they, they call boat captains skippers over in the UK. So according to Skipper John Thornton, I, I was like the 12th diver to dive uh, the Hampshire itself. It, it is a controversial wreck because a lot of people thought that the British themselves off Lord Kitchener because World War I at that time had just bogged down into the stalemate of trench warfare on the continent. And people thought the war should have been over very, very quickly. I mean, it was clearly a, a delusional, in retrospect, at least a delusional thought. But, you know, there, there was, you know, when World War I first broke out in 1914, um, there was this whole thing, oh, cavalry charges, it would be glorious. And People in all the major capitals in Europe were, were cheering on the fact there was going to be this war. And instead, it, it bogged down into trench warfare and the horrible carnage that we know today that it was. So with, with Lord Kitchener being secretary for war, and that was before, of course, they, they changed all these titles uh, sort of, you know, in, in Newspeak. Um, now, now we call it secretary of defense. But back then it was, you know, what it really is, secretary for war. A lot of people were critical of, of him, even in the in the British press, which was unthinkable before this time, because again, he was considered such a hero of the British Empire. So, um, so a lot of people thought, well, the British had planted bombs on this thing and just got rid of the guy. Uh, and you could see here how close this is to one of the islands. This, by the way, I don't know if you could really make that out. That's a tower that was actually erected by the people of Orkney after the fact uh, to Lord Kitchener. And, and you can go see that today and there's a plaque. Um, one of the things that is also controversial about this is, is when people heard this big explosion, um, the people of Orkney, they have a, a life uh, saving service there. It's a boat you know, service, rescue service. They tried to go out to the ship to try to rescue people um, sailors were washing up ashore. A lot of them were dead or, or dying of hypothermia. Uh, they were actually turned away at bayonet point by the British Army that does have a barracks here. So, you know, it's kind of like, hmm, what's going on there? So this is a, a, a diagram by John Harding, a, a buddy of mine, who did this after I dove the wreck and described to him what I was seeing. Um, here, this dotted part is what's no longer there. This is the bow of the ship, which was not only blown away, but very, very cleanly. There was this whole area here that was very, very clean. Um, and it was really remarkable that a, a ship would be so clean like that when it's hit a mine. You would expect large hull plates bending inward, that sort of thing, but nothing like this. Well, it turned out that the Royal Navy, after the ship sank, the Royal Navy went to the wreck after the storm had blown over, and they went in and, quote unquote, cleaned up the area a little bit, which lend, lended some credence to the conspiracy theory that the, the British themselves had planted bombs that went off to sink the ship to get rid of Lord Kitchener. So, of course, there would be a new policy pursued in the war. That was the, the thinking of this conspiracy theory. Again, this here is in about 206 feet of water uh, to the sand. Um, I'd like to now talk about the British Army expedition, which happened in 1996. There was a search for HMS Pheasant. This was a, a World War I destroyer, British, and it went, it disappeared um, under mysterious circumstances. And you might think, well, gee, it's a World War I destroyer during a, a war. Well, you know, it sank somewhere. What's the controversy? Um, well, the controversy was that the captain of the pheasant was supposedly being, uh, you know, run very quickly. He was supposed to be heading to uh, an admiralty position. Uh, he came from a very, very well-placed family, and we know how important that is, especially in, a, uh, in British society. And so um, he was being earmarked for literally becoming an admiral fairly young. 
So without any radio message or anything, he just left um, Scrap of Flow and wasn't heard from again. So the British Army um, in 1996, they had approved the use of technical diving techniques rather than military or commercial diving towards personnel. Um, I was invited, I wasn't in the British Army. Uh, I was born in England, but um, that, that had nothing to do with this. They, uh, I was one of uh, three civilians that were invited and authorized to dive it. Thomas Aesop was, was another. And Kevin Gurr, the, the uh, technical diving trainer, a British guy was also uh, invited. He trained these um, guys who were already divers, but he trained them to do technical diving. Um, Kevin couldn't make it because of other uh, conflicts, which is kind of sad. But uh, uh, anyway, Tom and I were, were on this thing. Um, so we thought we would find the wreck in 230 feet of water. And the Royal Navy kind of laughed at us and said, no, no, there's nothing close to where you're looking. The closest thing is a German uh, U-boat, a submarine, right? And, and it's in over 300 feet of water. But locals, um, you know, had... had reportedly uh, heard it go down and, and they thought they knew the general area. In the event, we found and dived the wreck in 280 feet of water. And here you could see some of the photos that uh, Tom Aesop took. Um, one of the real challenges of diving pheasant is that it's in an area of the world where there are no tides tables. Why? Because three different tidal uh, currents and shifts are meeting at this particular spot and they come from different areas. So it, tides tables are useless. On one particular day here, we had to literally suit up and de-kit three times because the skipper was trying to read the waters. And then he was, okay, get ready. I think in about 20, 30 minutes, we should be good to go. We get all ready to go. Um, and, and here, this is Ian Bellamy, one of the British uh, uh, soldiers. And, and uh, he says that he is, um, in visualizing, right, the positive visualization of the dive and this and that, but we maintain that he just fell asleep during all of this. So, um, but uh, in any case, part of the approval of diving this was that it, the British Army has an um, adventure uh, program that is supposed to build character. And part of the criteria for this is that there should be enough of a danger that there's a possibility of injury or death. Um, and so they would send their, their personnel out uh, to do this as it's well-planned. If it was well-planned and executed, of course, then, then there wouldn't be injury and death. So uh, th this then when, when um, uh, Neil Russell uh, was, I think a major at the time when, when he was putting it all together, it took him two years to get the approval, but he finally did. So uh, in the event, it was really, really big news. I'll show you some uh, footage from the BBC. Uh, this was being aired, you know, for weeks um, before and, and then during. It was in the newspapers and everything that, that we'd all be doing this. And here we could see um, a photo by Tom Aesop, or two of the British guys. Uh, you could see a very, very black water here. And here is a BBC cameraman covering this event for the news. Uh, the first day that, that we dove it, only two of our guys could get down because of the shifts in the current, but we got them in the water and we didn't know if they had actually gotten down to the wreck uh, until they came back up. And they said, yeah, we, we did it. We saw it, you know, we got down to the wreck. Um, so I said to the BBC, I said, well, you know, no, nobody else had video cameras. And I said, look, if you guys give me an underwater video camera, I'll do my bit and shoot some footage on this thing. Now, mind you, it's a deep wreck. It, you know, the deck was like 270. And, um, and I said, you know, you, you got to give me one that'll tolerate that, uh, that depth and something with lights on it, please, because it's, you know, as you see here, pitch black. This, this by the way, was our cover shot in, I believe it was the fall of 1996 issue of Immersed Magazine. Uh, it was by Tom Aesop. So anyway, the, the, the BBC... Um, it ended up flying a camera to us, uh, and it you know it took a couple of days, but they did. But on the thing it says you know the, the, on the the waterproof housing it's rated to 50 meters. Well, that's 165 feet, and I was planning on going you know at least 100 feet deeper than that. But I said, hey, what the heck? It's their camera, right? <laughs> They've been warned. 
So I went in and surprisingly, the housing held up and didn't flood. Um, but it was pretty challenging because they didn't give me any lights with it. So I, I had to hold uh, my light in, in, in my uh, left hand and in the right hand, I'm holding the camera trying to coordinate the two. And, um, but some of that, what I did get on the deck was uh, shell, there was a box of, of shells as in like, you know, um, uh, artillery shells. And ultimately the pheasant would be identified buy some paper in those shells that, that identified uh, what lot they were from, and, and then they were able to trace that to the pheasant itself. Uh, other groups have subsequently gone after us and found that the pheasant is in three different pieces, but we didn't know that because of the very limited number of dives we could do on it. So artifacts. Um, a lot of people ask about artifacts themselves. And this here, it, three different divers came up with, with these uh, brass cage lights uh, on the same you know, dive itself. Um, it's kind of a, a dodgy situation, a little bit of a fishy story here. Um, can you take artifacts? No, not off the German fleet wrecks. Now they, they do change their minds every once in a while, whether you can take them from another area uh, that we, call the scrap yards. And here, again, going back to the turrets of the Bayern, you could see here this large indentation, right? So when the, when the wrecks themselves were, were being lifted up, a lot of stuff would just fall out there. Plus the guys were on site for so long with their uh, floating dock and everything that, that they would throw literally bottles uh, and even plates would sometimes just be tossed over or would fall overboard. Uh, here you see Tim Urbanski and Bob Urich um, just collecting some of the stuff from the scrapyards. So you, you could go along here and collect these. This used to be okay. Uh, I don't know if they've stopped that. And, and again, even if, if today it's okay, you know, next year it might not be. So um, you do need to ask the skippers what the rules are and where you're going and if it's okay to take anything. Uh, this here is Evie Dudas and I after one of our uh, a jaunts here, we caught crabs um, that we later ate. And also here are some bottles. I think these bottles were actually recovered by Tom Aesop. And he just, you know, would look at the bottles. There were so many of them just strewn about uh, on the ocean floor here that, that he would just decide, you know, which ones he wanted to keep. And even on the back on the boat, he would look at them and if he didn't like them, he'd just toss them over. This particular one in the center, I mean, it has some, some really nice writing on it and stuff. This has some writing, and I don't know, I think this might've had a mark on the bottom, which is why he kept it. But, um, you know, nice shot by him here. And you could see Evie and I collected some, there was a mug, there was some, you know, uh, some little plates and stuff like that besides the crabs. So um, I'd like to thank Charles Tate Photography, Scott Rowan, John Ganson, John Griffiths and Ole Miss, Dr. Simon Mitchell, and Thomas Aesop for the use uh, of uh, some of their photos. Um, one of the things uh, that I was asked to talk about is, is what kind of projects I'm working on or something in the future. This is called Diving for Cures. Um, Jack did mention this, and uh, this is an ongoing project. Uh, Nasreen started before uh, I had met her, but um, this is a photo by, by uh, Olga Torre shows just the thing, what we would do is just go down with these tubes and we can collect sediments or sponges or anything that, that we think could um, maybe have some potential um, elements in it for uh, use to develop ultimately as pharma pharmaceutical. Um, an interesting note, there are quite a number of drugs from the sea that, that are being used. Uh, the first drug against HIV AIDS uh, is called AZT. It's a short AZT, but it actually was derived from sponges found off of Florida. And this was like a new type of sponge. So that happened in the, I think it was the late eighties that they actually came out with AZT. Um, and since then, like for instance, the blood of horseshoe crabs is, is also uh, being used as a drug. And there are many, many other things now. This is a shot of us here. There's a, basically we set up a, a field lab to collect and, and document some of the stuff. And here you see uh, some of the test tubes and we're doing some testing here. Um, now, uh, Dr. Hawk is, is more commonly known to Nasreen as she's my wife, right? As Jack had, uh, had mentioned before. We have published a couple of scientific papers uh, on our discoveries 
And um, we also gave a presentation uh, on one of the projects at the American Academy of Underwater Sciences at their national symposium down in Key West a few years ago. This is just an ongoing thing. Uh, I call it diving for drugs. I'm writing an article about it now, and uh, that will be on, uh, I plan on publishing that on, on Medium. Um, if you're interested in, in more about Orkney and also sort of my connection with with the German Rex and, and my German relatives, uh, I've written a long form article and I believe there'll be a, a link that Jack will share. That's on, uh, that's on Medium. There's another article I have there, a non-diving article. But if you're interested in any of that, you can, you can read it there. Ah, we have some, I almost forgot. Uh, we do have some videos, so. Let me... Yeah, that'd be, that's from the BBC shots of the yeah, pheasant, right? So, all right, so right now, let me save that, and then, all right, let's, I'm just turning off this. All right, so now I'm gonna show you a clip. Uh, now what we have to um, uh, do the thing with the, uh, okay, so let me bring this up and pause it. Oh. Can you hear that okay, Jack? Uh, you might have, did you do sharing with the sound? I don't think you did the screen sharing with the sound. Okay, so I'll start it again with, let me just adjust this. No, I mean, when you, yeah, there you go. Okay, screen sharing. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, it says share with sound. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then. Final resting place. There you go. Back here. Is that is that uh, loud enough? Yeah. The destroyer had been guarding the entrance to Scapa Flow and has thought she may have been hit by a floating mine. Two and a half years ago, an Army sports diving team from the Adjutant General Corps, based in Hampshire, decided to be the first to find the wreck. She went down so fast that there was no radio message whatsoever. Uh, there were no survivors. Only one person was picked up from the surface, a midshipman Cotter, but was dead on arrival. And it is very, very strange that a craft so close to a huge naval establishment goes down that quickly. The wreck of the pheasant is lying in about 80 meters of water, and the team has spent the last week carrying out special training to enable them to dive to that depth. This dive is pioneering or pushing forward the frontiers of recreational diving. We're the first Army recreational sports diving team to be authorized and permitted to dive below 50 meters. Preparation for the dive is intense. The team gets it up and then there's an anxious wait of more than an hour and a half before the tides are right. We're now directly above the area where the wreck of the pheasant is believed to be. Although seven of the team were due to make the 80 meter descent to the seabed, only two have gone because of sudden changes in tidal conditions. At that depth, they'll have just 14 minutes to locate and examine the wreck site and hopefully throw some light on a 79 year old maritime mystery. For the rest, the hour and 20 minutes that their colleagues are below the surface passes very slowly, but when their colleagues emerge, the news is good. We put our lights on, and as we drop down towards the bottom, we've actually seen the wreckage spread out in front of us. And obviously, we followed the line right to the bottom where it was hooked into a piece of wreckage. We came right up to the, the head of the torpedo as well. Just two of them sat there. I was trying to measure them with, the, with my, my arm, and they're actually from there to there across the torpedoes. Definitely the pheasant, nothing else it could be. Uh, two, two tubes. And is that video available somewhere too for people? Uh, hold on, I'm trying to. Uh, no, I'm not able to turn it off for some reason. Uh. <laughs> Technology. Um, okay, hold, hold on, I'm trying to turn this off right now, but there's no. Uh, escape key. I don't know. No, that's not working either. Oh, here. Okay. Let me, let me just do that. Sorry for, sorry for this bit here. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't have this, um, you know, I haven't posted this anywhere or anything. And, and it's actually, you know, it's BBC copyright. So, it, you know, I can show it as, as part of a presentation. I don't think they'd mind that. Um, 
you know, but I, I haven't posted it. I guess I would need permission to post it on a website somewhere, but okay. Uh, but let me, um, okay, hang on. So share screen. Okay. Um, can you see me or, or I don't see anybody right now, Jack. Oh, How's okay. This? Oh, hang on. Uh, you want to just put me on here as a talking head? <laughs> yeah, hang on. Uh, I, I got a couple of interesting stories to tell about that little bit too, by the way. Okay, there we are. Uh, so I, I kind of cringed. I think we all did when we were there listening. We were behind, you know, the guys being interviewed. Um, it was Don Shirley uh, on the right-hand side uh, of the screen speaking, the divers, right? And when they were, when they were describing the, the shells, we were all like, oh, don't mention that you found any kind of, of <laughs> munitions shells because we were under strict orders from the uh, British Admiralty that if you found any ammunition, you had to cease operations. And then they would have to send a Navy dive team to, you know, disarm the ammunition or, or otherwise get rid of it. And so we knew that if we talked about any ammunition, uh, our, you know, expedition here would be over, right? And these guys were mentioning this on something that, that would be on national TV. <laughs> and like, uh, but in the event, I guess the, the Admiralty wasn't watching that night because they didn't shut us down. And, and we did, you know, the whole team did end up uh, diving in a couple days later, uh, excuse me, a storm moved through. So we had to wait a couple days, but then we did, we did all get on it, which was pretty exciting. Um, the other thing about, about Don Shirley, um, his name may ring a bell because he was uh, part of that uh, dive. Uh, there was a dive in, in Africa uh, in a cave system where they found uh, a body of another diver who had been there for a long time. And they, had, they, asked the relatives, do you want us to bring them up? And this was a, a very deep depth. And um, so the relatives said yes. And then, and then the guy uh, who was trying to bag the body literally mm -hmm. um, died of, of what appears to be a, a CO2 buildup. And um, there's documentaries about it and all that stuff that, that you can find. You probably find it on YouTube now. Yeah, it's that's... been aired. And, uh, you know, it's funny because, you know, Don, Don and I, were on this expedition with it. I hadn't seen him for a while, but both of us were in Sweden uh, at Stockholm to, to give a talk at a tech conference. And, um, you know, he talked about that particular uh, incident. That was his talk. And it was like, oh, you know. Because so, he, he, was, he was the second, wasn't he? The second deep diver on that. On, he was a where, safety diver. Yeah, yeah he um, was the second deepest person though, where his computer uh, flooded uh supposedly was supposed to handle the depth but, but the face cracked on it yeah i mean i i don't um i don't remember that part but i, I remember that that uh you know he went he heroically went to try to you know rescue his buddy and all that stuff and he got very badly bent i believe um you know as a result of that but then did make a full recovery but uh you know, it's a pretty gut-wrenching story. And, and if anybody's interested, they, they should look that up. I don't know if it was in Bushman's Got Cave or, uh, but it, but if you had, you know, deep cave diving death, in, you know, in Africa or, or even Don Shirley's name, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you'll come up with that. So, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm impressed with, with all this stuff. I mean, all the technical diving that you've done and just, you know, some of the names you're just mentioning, you know, uh, Tom and, and was it Evelyn? Um, they're all at Boston Sea Rovers uh, just yeah. recently. And I just met them just this last weekend um, yeah. and was having conversations with them. So it's, um, it's amazing everything that, you know, I would say, I guess my predecessors <laughs> have, have done. I mean, it's, it's, and it's, uh, it's amazing all the pioneering and, you know, what you, you know, at the time you're, you're, it's like the state of the art, but then Nowadays, we kind of look back and go, ooh, that's kind of scary, <laughs> you know, because we know more about the physiology and, and the different things that are going on, you know, and of course, technology advancing along, along the way, so. I, I sure could have used the, uh, the, the DUI heated suit on my Iceland project there and doing that in, in, in the cave in Silver Halir, which is, to my knowledge, the only 
a diveable cave formed as a direct result of the of tectonic plates shifting, and it would be the North American and European plates. They're actually rifting apart. And uh, yeah, that, that was pretty cold, and I was in the water a long, long time, you know, uh, doing various stuff there in, in different cave systems. So, uh, but yeah, you know, back then it was just, you know, put on more bundles of, uh, uh, you know, of undergarments to keep yourself warm and then shiver it out. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. So there was one question is, uh, it seemed like all the, all the pictures or the side scans that you had, all the ships uh, in Scapa were all turtled upside down. Um, the, the dreadnoughts, all, all of the dreadnoughts, because they're so large. And, uh, and, and the, the turrets, the gun turrets were so heavy um, that they literally led to them tipping over. All of the light cruisers are on their sides. So it, it's kind of interesting. And they're also in shallower, the light cruisers were in shallower water. Uh, you know, and just that's the way they anchored them, which is kind of smart uh, to do it that way, right? Because the dreadnoughts just needed more water underneath them. But, um, you know, yeah, that's how, that's how they are. Yeah, so what I didn't realize was that the depths weren't uh, as deep as I was expecting. I thought every single one of these were gonna be technical dives and not necessarily within recreational, you know, the 130 foot limits. Um, yeah. So that's, I, I thought everything was going to be a, a technical dive. No, not at, at Scapa though. You know, it, it's, it's cold water diving. Um, I, I recommend dry suit. It is dry suit diving. Uh, one uh, on, I used to lead a lot of trips there. Um, one of the guys thought he'd be able to tolerate it in, in his wetsuit. And uh, after the first dive, um, there was, there was a dive shop there and, and he rented a dry suit, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, yeah. Um, Definitely dry suit diving. Uh, well, this is awesome. So um, I, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, if this is, uh, this is, I mean, I, I, all I can say is just incredible. I mean, I, I just love listening to this. And um, when you're diving wrecks and then all the, the history part that you go into it, as far as like finding out about these ships, um, it just leads more to the story. So when you do see these things underwater, it's just that much more, you know, impactful, you know, just getting that story behind it versus just going out and just going, oh, look what I found. You know, I don't know what it is, but it's cool. You know, so. So, so one, of the, one of the things about that, um, uh, Tom, Tom Aesop and I ended up going, we were diving in the Arctic Circle at a place called Narvik. I had read a, uh, I was reading, you know, some stuff about World War II, and then I read about this great naval battle at Narvik, and, and there were 10 German destroyers in this thing, there were airplanes, there were all these other ships, and I'm like, oh my God, why haven't I heard about this before? Now, this is, of course, a long time ago, and, you know, it's really before the the the, the um, internet became ubiquitous, but uh, so I had to actually write letters. Excuse me one moment. I actually had to write letters. Um, to try to find out somebody that, you know, could support some dives over there and stuff. And, and we ended up, uh, uh, Tom and I did, we ended up going there and, and doing the dives, you know? And I said to him, here's this huge file I've got. I don't know if we'll actually be able to dive, but but let's go there and, and see, you know, and, and we did. And, you know, he got some great shots of all that stuff. And, and Tom and I have spoken about that together at different shows and everything. So uh, yeah, you know, just reading about stuff even today, you can find out about things and not everything has been explored and not everything is widely known. You know, the Iceland stuff, for instance, today, now a lot of divers go there because there's an open water area that's crystal clear water, very cold. Yeah, but people even go snorkeling there. I mean, that just didn't exist when I, when I went. I mean, there were no steps leading down into the water and all that stuff. And, and uh, it, you know, now, it's different, but um, you know, you got to start somewhere. And then people say, "Oh, wow! If other people are interested, maybe we can have support for these kind of dives." And, and I really want to thank uh, uh, Dick Long and, and DUI for um, supporting me over the years with a lot of this stuff, with, with making a great, great product uh, to, to use. And um, they've also supported a lot of projects that that I've participated in, not necessarily led, but participated in. And, uh, and as I was saying to Dick before this, I really appreciate uh, all that and, and, and a great product that uh, I, I still love diving, but diving it for decades, literally, so. <clears throat> yeah, uh, <laughs> it looks like you're diving a CF200 that's probably the same one. <laughs> they last forever. 
Yeah, they do. Yeah. I, I actually wore one out because um, you can wear them out after a while. But let me tell you, I was diving in, in, in uh, lava caves and, and that's very rough uh, on, uh, on any kind of gear that you have. It just tears at the gear and all that stuff. So the, the, the wrecks, the lava caves and all that, you know, so eventually, yeah, I had to get another one. <laughs> Okay, so well, I need to wrap this up. Um, we we went a little over time, but uh, uh, I could do this all day long. Um, and I would love to have you come back and and update us on on the, as you said, diving for drugs. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. yeah. Especially when you say diving for drugs in Florida, then it kind of goes, hmm, <laughs> is this a movie? <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to have you come back and, and, you know, give us updates on this stuff. I mean, cause this is, this is awesome. So, yeah. I mean, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That'd be great. So we got some interesting stuff coming up um, and other news. Oh, are you going to, uh, are you going to show, oh, excuse me. You're going to show them the, the contact uh, yes, info yeah, and, and have yeah, a link I'll, to that story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put some links in the chat messages of the Facebook live and in the zoom. Okay. Uh, All right, and then cool. I will display that screen too. Once we're, we're done done talking here so okay. um i'll show that too uh okay. some some events coming up just in case you people aren't you people uh, in just case people aren't aware of it um dema is is happening so far in in november uh dui will be there we're going to be in booth 401 um it should be right by the entrance entrance exit of the show uh so please come by and and check out what we've got um, we'd love to meet with you guys and talk, um, even if it's just talking about, you know, uh, like when I was at Boston Sea Rovers, it's talking about what local diving people are doing, how they're using the suits, you know, uh, it's, it's where we get the inspiration to either make changes, make new products, or try to make things that will work for, you know, dives going forward for people. So um, that's one of the things that, you know, we're I, I guess kind of pride ourselves at is we make a lot of things custom for what people's needs are. Um, so look for us again um, for deep dive coming up in in November and December. Um, I have some uh, Channel Islands presentations planned and also the one of the longest dives um, by a female diver. Um, that one may not happen till after the first of the year though. Uh, but anyways, these are upcoming uh, presentations that we have. So again, Bernie, thank you for coming. Um, this is awesome. Um, and I hope to talk to you real soon. Um, and maybe get out there and dive with you one of these days too. That would be yeah, awesome. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. So, uh, so thanks. I'm going to, uh, end this now. So thanks for coming everybody. And I am going to show the ending screen of everything. And there you go. So now you see the links. Um, you can uh, definitely go to the Facebook event, um, ask questions there. Um, we will, we constantly monitor that or all these things and, and try to answer questions. And, and Bernie will probably be there answering questions. Um, so there you can see his Facebook links, his uh, LinkedIn, and then the link to his, um, the up, or the ongoing current project that he's working on. Um, so now, the link, the, Jack. Yeah. This this is the the article I wrote about the Orkney Islands. Oh, that one is okay. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't there another link? There was. Um, no. Uh, actually, I could send you a link to if people want to know about the other stuff. To uh, uh, our not for profit is called Genomic Observatory. Uh, and that's yeah. Genomicobservatory .com. So yeah, send me uh, that I, link, I, and yeah. I can add that too. That would be great. Okay. All right um but anyways the links there it's clickable from from the chat or the comments area uh, so you don't have to remember you know this big long url uh the type in so again thanks everyone for coming out uh we'll see you next month on the first thursday of the month thanks we wrapping it up here i don't know what uh yeah we're all done yeah so, so you shut everybody else off right yeah well while well, we're still they can still oh. okay <laughs> well, well that was really cool look thanks for having me I, I really enjoyed it it was great catching up with dick long a little bit uh yeah i haven't spoken to him in so long and and obviously a guy i i i, I greatly admire and 
and, and thank for all the stuff. I've known him obviously for many years, so it's just good seeing him again. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if you, if Bernie, if you could just hang on for a second here, okay? Oh, okay, sure. Okay, let me see. Okay. Okay. What's going on? Uh, I'm just stopping the live stream.